has all led us here to this great city of Baltimore. Ladies and gentlemen, from Baltimore, Maryland. If there's anybody that's a big star in Baltimore, it's you. In the Baltimore, whether you like it or not, you can learn a little bit about the best million. This is tonight, as Jackie Jeff Rustin returns to Baltimore at the Baltimore Civic Center tonight. And I have picked Baltimore else to be the place. Hello, wrestling fans, and welcome to the Rama podcast. Today, we're going to be looking at the life and death of Art Barr, the love machine. Uh, we're going to be doing a new feature with the podcast where we're going to go back and look at some historical uh, issues, some historical episodes, some historical happenings, uh, whether it's in this case an obituary of a wrestler. Uh, maybe we'll read about a, a true crime happening within the wrestling world. We'll even read some excerpts from pro wrestling books. Uh, and maybe even some old pro wrestling magazines. But today we're reading from the December 5th, 1994 issue of the Wrestling Observer, uh, titled Historical Death of Art Bar Issue. Uh, it starts with a poem written by Lionheart Chris Jericho. Uh, who wrote this on Thanksgiving Day 1994 in Mexico City. Uh, It's called When You Lose a Brother. Trying to forget the news that you're gone so soon. It leaves me crushed and broken, so sad I don't know what to do. A brother is more than blood, more than just a name. Even though we have different families, we were brothers just the same. We weren't brothers in flesh and blood, we were brothers of circumstance sharing stories and good times, sharing the same visions and dreams. I remember so many times when each other was all we had, helping to conquer the difficulties of being two strangers in a strange land. Yet I'm very thankful at the end of that one day when we exchanged the words, I love you, as only true brothers can say. Because even though you have gone to a place we all shall see, We shared respect, love, admiration, and fun, and you will always be with me. Chris Lionheart Jericho, Thanksgiving 1994, Mexico City. And now we're going into the Observer's writings. Sometimes life isn't exactly how it seems. In the case of Love Machine to the very end, life never turned out to be the way it seemed. Machine, and it's odd he's calling him Love Machine instead of his name Art Bar. A machine who came into his own as the best heel in pro wrestling over the past few months. Um, And this is my opinion. Really over that last year from like that 1993 period up until his death, that dude was on fire, man. He had the world at his hands. Uh, Back to the Observer. Machine passed away apparently in his sleep on 11-23, the day before Thanksgiving, at his home in the Eugene, Oregon suburb of Springfield. Results of the autopsy couldn't determine a cause of death. In 28 years, his life took many unpredictable twists and turns. He was like a top spinning around with endless energy and enthusiasm. But like a top, he was never in control of his own destiny. Some outside force always took over and made the direction of his life exactly what it didn't appear to be. Art Barr, after getting his Monday paycheck, flew back from Mexico City on Tuesday to pick up his five-year-old son, Dexter, who spent the weekend with his mother, Gloria Abston. The next day, his mother tried to call him throughout the day. When there was continually no answer, she drove to the house. Between 4 and 5 p.m., she knocked on the door, and again, there was no answer. She went over to the bedroom window and saw Art and Dexter both asleep on his waterbed. She pounded on the window, waking Dexter up, who let her in. She noticed he was cold and clammy, and there was blood coming out of his nose. When she couldn't get Art awakened, she went next door to the neighbors and called 911. When medical help arrived, they pronounced him dead, 
believing he had been dead anywhere from 6 to 24 hours. Lane County Coroner Frank Rowdy couldn't determine a cause of death after an autopsy that wasn't completed until the following Monday. Although it was heavily reported in the Mexican and Spanish language media the day after his death that the cause was a brain aneurysm, one of several first aid theories, the autopsy ruled that out. Also ruled out was any foul play, a ring injury, or lingering effects from an, an injury, as there was no trauma to the body or internal organs. There was no heart attack, no organ damage or problems, no internal bleeding, no stroke, no cancer, and nothing else visually obvious. He had take, taken sleeping pills the night before to get to sleep, halcyons, perhaps volumes, although Raddy wasn't even hinting at an overdose. Coverage of the death symbolized in many ways the cultural barriers not only between the United States and Mexico, but between Americans who speak Spanish and English as their primary language. The death received prominent coverage throughout Mexico on the country's 24-hour news station, with a feature running regularly throughout the day. It was a major story on the network evening news and on every 10 p.m. newscast in Mexico, and was covered on page 10 of the front section of the Mexico City equivalent of the New York Times. Within the United States, it received a surprising amount of coverage on many Spanish-language newscasts within California and on Spanish cable, including a four-minute feature on the Galavision News with Arturo Rivera. There was no English-language coverage except in his hometown of Portland, Oregon, where he had achieved some infamy for a criminal past. Even to his death, he remained a political hot potato at the Oregonian, the local newspaper, to the point where it would be impossible to write anything positive about him in the newspaper, even about his wrestling career, and even in death. Indeed, in his obit, his entire career, details of which were known, was summed up in two sentences. Following the sexual assault incident, Barr signed on with Ted Turner's World Championship Wrestling in Atlanta. Arthur Barr's father is Sandy Barr, a widely known Portland professional wrestler and promoter. He was very high on life, said Carlos Conan Espada, who met him in WCW in late 1990 and opened the door for him to come to Mexico with EMLL the next year and had come to refer to him in recent months as our Ric Flair. He had been given a second opportunity in wrestling and had made the most of it. He just came off a five-star match on a pay-per-view and haven't even hit his potential. The loss is immeasurable on both a personal and professional level, said Ron Scholar, who heads IWC, which promoted AAA events in the United States. I could only give him the highest praise. He had taken great strides to get his personal life in order and his professional life in order. I think he was going to be the Roddy Piper of the 90s, a Roddy Piper who was a great worker. His father, not surprisingly, canceled his Thanksgiving night show. In Mexico City, at the AAA office, the tears didn't stop flowing all day. Two nights later, in Compton, California, a distraught Rey Mysterio and Rey Mysterio Jr. led a moving prayer and a ten-bell salute in the middle of a wrestling ring. Later that night, Stan Stasiak and Tito Carrion hosted the local wrestling show in Portland, devoting the entire hour to him, talking about his death, the early part of his career, and air the incident where Roddy Piper gave him his first gimmick and three of his matches. Art Barr, in his all-too-short life, started as the son of a wrestler and became a too-small prelim wrestler, a top local cartoon character babyface, a prelim wrestler with a national promotion, a guy who disappeared in his country only to only become a headliner and set the attendance records for two of the biggest and best drawing promotions in the world, the best heel in the business, and a person who changed the style of wrestling blending the best of the styles from Mexico, the United States, and Japan all have to offer into almost a futuristic international melting pot of a style. 
in what turned out to be the last match and quite possibly the best match of his life. He appeared on the biggest wrestling event ever in his home country, produced by a foreign-based promotion. But not only was he Love Machine and the Juicer, he became known as something else. He was called the Rapist, and names even worse. He became the call celebrity in his hometown for two lenient sentencing. Others close to the situation believed he became a political pawn in a feud involving a local athletic commissioner, a newspaper, and with two pro wrestling promotions who just didn't comprehend the situation. Love Machine was the son of a former prelim wrestler, Farron Dandy Sandy Barr, who actually became a better-known figure around his hometown of Portland, Oregon, for his two decades of service as the striped shirt expressionless referee every Saturday night on Portland Wrestling, a local institution on Channel 12. Art practically grew up in the sport, Portland sports arena, the 2,000-seat converted bowling alley that ran wrestling every Saturday night once a month for Tuesday specials, uh, which his father helped Dono and promote, and where his father ran the weekly Sunday afternoon flea market. From the age of eight, the sports arena was practically his playground. He grew up amidst the wrestling fans, the arena rats, and the local television wrestlers, the most famous of which was his hero, Roddy Piper. Piper, the local drawing card, unparalleled, spent several years in Oregon, where he ended up making his home, at the time when it was thought by narrow-minded promoters in larger and more lucrative territories, he, at 210 pounds, was too small to ever make it big. There were countless others he met as a teenager, from future national superstars like Adrian Adonis, Kurt Henning, Jimmy Snuka, to local legends who never really made it outside Oregon, like Playboy Buddy Rose and Rip the Crippler Oliver, to can't-miss prospects who never quite got there like Ron Starr, Billy Jack Haynes, and Tom Zink, to those whom tragedy struck at an early age, like Lonnie Moondog Maine and a wrestler whose incredible wrestling talents were no match for even his more incredible propensity for self-destruction, Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer. There were others that bar saw the sports arena, who achieved the same early end, but whose exploits had been all but forgotten like Steve Schumann. He was taught to wrestle by his father, and like his older brother, Farring Jr., Jesse Barr, and Matt Osborne, started wrestling as a babyface among the fans who had seen him grown up every Saturday night. He was not only taught wrestling, but the ways of wrestling, its psychology, the constant conning, or working as it was known in the trade, the drugs, and the easy and available sex. Before even starting as a wrestler, as an 18-year-old, he had a cocaine possession conviction on his record. Just a few years out of high school, Art, despite his limited size, got his start in his father and brother's profession on April 2nd, 1987, in Salem, Oregon. At 175 pounds, he was a good worker, almost from the start, but was too small to be taken as a serious wrestler, even in a territory that didn't revolve around steroids and humongous size, as did most of the profession at the time. He seemed destined to be a good worker, who probably would become a preliminary fixture on the local circuit, like his father was in the 60s and early 70s, only faster and more agile, but never go anywhere else. He'd work the 20 and 30 minute preliminary matches against other young men breaking in or past their prime veterans either looking to go somewhere or to hang on. Per perhaps he'd on occasion become the foil of an angle either to bring his big brother, who at the time was thought to have potential to make it as a national star, into the mix as a big brother, little brother tag team, or even for the annual angle to lure his father out of retirement. It was Piper 
Barr's mentor in wrestling, who came up with his first career break. Piper himself would hang around the sports arena and throw in booking ideas while he was on his frequent WWF hiatuses and retirements. Got an idea. On January 21st, 1989, Piper told Barr to take his standard ring gear off, changed him into raggedy clothes, put white makeup on his face, flour in his hair, and named him Beetlejuice after the lead character of a hit movie and later a children's cartoon series of the same name. As the ultimate cartoon character in probably the most traditional style wrestling company in existence, Beetlejuice became the most popular wrestler in the promotion. He would come out to entrance music and lead a procession of kids, ranging from tiny children to young teenagers, many dressed up just like him, like a Pied Piper dancing to the ring. There, by far the smallest wrestler in the promotion, dressed like a cartoon with the flower in his hair that he'd shake and get all over the ring when he'd make his comeback, generally vanquish the bad guys, in particular, a crotchety past his prime wrestler named Al Madrill, who proclaimed each week how he hated kids. Six months later, on July 16, 1989, came an incident that would forever change his life, in which, within the city he grew up and in the profession he worked, he would seemingly forever be associated with. After a show in Pendleton, Oregon, Barr was with a 19-year-old wrestling fan named Angela. In the deserted armory, late at night, underneath a stairwell, a sexual encounter took place. Barr was charged with first-degree rape. Since Barr had been dancing with young children like a Pied Piper on Saturday night television, and his father a fixture on the show, first as a wrestler, then as a ref for some 25 years, this turned into more than a rape case. Don Owen and Sandy Barr, who were running the company, seemed to have no understanding what a power powder keg they were playing with. Even after the incident hit the local newspaper, the Oregonian, Beetlejuice came out the following Saturday and every Saturday after that and did his thing, wrestling as in often in the case, being oblivious to the outside world, which often leads to problems. This caused a political tremor. Several reporters sympathetic to the victim and to the nature of the crime were appalled by this accused rapist dancing with young children and being portrayed as a hero. And for the most part, seeing the fans, particularly the kids, buy it week after week. The most sizzling newspaper copy probably ever written in the city followed over and over, most notably by columnist Margie Bull. It never let up. The promotion continued to feature his character, but started hedging his bets. The territory created a second juicer, the hilariously named Big Juicer, Jeff Warner, who later worked briefly for WCW as J.W. Storm, and the two held the tag team titles twice in early 1990. Bull and much of the Portland community got more appalled as Barr was mobbed by children on television every Saturday night as his case was growing near. But that was only the beginning of what would happen. In July of 1990, the day his trial was to begin, Barr plea bargained the first-degree rape charge down to a first-degree sexual abuse charge and was ordered to pay a $1,000 fine, pay for all the victim's medical and counseling bills, sentenced to 180 hours of community service work, and placed on two years probation. Barr who perhaps because of the environment he had grown up in and lived with the easy access to more than willing female fans hanging around the back of the sports arena, or the exact details of the situation and how it related to that, never accepted he was guilty despite the plea. During the police investigation, while taking a lie detector test, Barr admitted having sex with the girl and that he had known at the time she didn't want to have sex with him on a stairway in an empty armory, but he believed she had been willing to have sex with him somewhere else. The girl testified differently that she never was willing 
and that she asked him to leave her alone numerous times at night. Still, Barr always claimed he could have beaten the case in court, but was advised against it since he was offered no jail time to cop the plea. By accepting the plea bargain, he was advised it would end all the pressure on him, he wouldn't be risking a prison term if he went to court and lost, and the negative publicity pressure mounting against his wrestling locally would die out. Since he was married with two very young children, it was imperative he was able to maintain his livelihood. As was the case with almost everything about his career, it turned out exactly the opposite as it seemed. The outcry only got worse, with Barr being portrayed as a celebrity example of a justice system gone awry. As the columnist raged, here was a television personality who admitted having sex with a woman without her consent in the back of a deserted armory and didn't spend a minute in prison for it. The outcry from the guilty plea bargain with no time in prison was so strong, the promotion finally decided to temporarily stop using him until the heat died down. But once again, nothing was as it seemed. At an Oregon Boxing and Wrestling Commission meeting on August 15, 1990, the subject of Barr came up. When there was talk of revoking Barr's wrestling license based on, based on the guilty plea, Legal counsel said it would be a very sticky legal situation even though there was media pressure on the commission to keep him from wrestling, which some believe was indirectly fueled by Commissioner Bruce Anderson himself. Anderson seemed to always be involved in one controversy after another with Owen and Sandy Barr, who despite the laws on the subject never accepted that Anderson had the power to regulate their industry, a power he used more seriously than any other commissioner in the country. Art was one of their top faces, but it came up at the meeting that a loophole was found. When Barr had filled out his license earlier, there was a question. Had he ever been convicted of a felony? Barr answered that he hadn't, ignoring the possession charge as a teenager. Since he had lied on his license application, it gave them legal grounds to deny him a future license. And at the meeting, it was made clear there will be no chance his license would be renewed, even after the newspaper heat died down. What this looked to have meant was a forced long-term hiatus from wrestling. Nobody ever believed, because of his size, especially in that time period, that he had any potential outside his home territory because of what pro wrestling had become. But, as it always did... It turned out just the opposite. As fate would have it, it was part of a series of events that culminated in his earning more money from wrestling than he would have ever believed possible as a kid watching the matches in the sports arena. More money than practically anyone in the business who saw him at the time would believe he had the potential for. Somehow, World Championship Wrestling, which at the time was still dueling the World Wrestling Federation, fairly equally in adult viewers, but was getting destroyed in the young children demographics, was desperate at the time to develop a character that would get children to watch on television and go to the matches. Somehow, a tape of bar is Beetlejuice, surrounded by dancing children, wound up being showed to Jim Hurd, who decided this was what the company needed, against the wishes of Booker Ole Anderson, who naturally cited he was too small to be a wrestler. Barr later, after making it big, liked to joke he was the same size as Anderson, only he wasn't fat. Despite the fact Barr's legal situation was well covered not only within wrestling publications, but had become a huge mainstream media story in his hometown, somehow Heard, Anderson, and company, as with many situations in that time period, were either oblivious or ignored this powder keg waiting to explode. Barr debuted as the Juicer with WCW. It was the same gimmick that got him over in Portland with the minor name change to protect WCW against possible licensing infringement, which promoters in Oregon never even considered. The Juicer was an opening match wrestler given, given an opening match push, but once again he got surprisingly strong crowd reactions, and once again life for Art Barr wasn't what it seemed. 
since he was getting a small television push with the same kid's hero character, the word got back to Portland, particularly the Oregonian and Bull. Another blistering column aimed at Turner Broadcasting followed. It was followed by a letter from the publisher of the newspaper to Turner himself, imploring him to ex- 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 exercise better judgment. At the same time, another source, nobody knows who except it came from a northeast area code, began faxing Bulls columns and Barr's other press from Oregon to local newspapers in city and cities Barr was about to appear in, letting them know WCW was portraying this individual as a kid's hero. Heard initially responded by saying he was 100% backing Barr and keeping his commitment, saying he paid his debt to society as the Oregon judiciary decreed, and it wasn't up to wrestling to continue to punish him. Items appeared in a paper or two, and at least in one case, it was independent of the faxing brigade, which led to crowd chants of rapist at the baby baby face. Heard backed off his original statement and finally agreed to continue using Barr uh, through his already planned bookings, but not book him any farther. Surely that was it for pro wrestling, at least for the foreseeable future. He couldn't even leave Oregon and leave his past behind him. But once again, things weren't as they seemed. In the latter days of his WCW stay, WCW brought Conan in from Southern California, largely because Hurd wanted a real Mexican tag team and a Pat O'Connor international tag team tournament he was promoting as part of Starcade 90 in St. Louis. During his week or two with WCW, Conan became friends with Barr, who at the time, even though the decision had already been made, wasn't told by anyone that his days were numbered. After returning to Mexico, Conan talked EMLL promoter Paco Alonso into giving good money deals to two wrestlers he met while in WCW that he thought had potential. Norman Smiley, Black Magic as a heel, and The Juicer, as a babyface. Love Machine, a masked American, was born in March 1991 at a time when the wrestling business had caught fire due to the introduction of televised matches to Mexico City. Whether the name was a final snap in the face at the Portland media, since he maintained to the end that the newspaper, Bruce Anderson, and the victim had railroaded him, a viewpoint that was controversial to say the least, or it was just coincidental, isn't known. When word got back to Portland, it was taken that way. More press followed about the sick irony of Art Bar wrestling under a mask in Mexico, using of all names Love Machine. But pressure couldn't cross the border this time. With no prejudicial notions about size in Mexico, where he was suddenly bigger and tougher than most of the wrestlers, and no media pressure, He could go as far as his ability would take him. That was pretty damn far. It would be easy to say, based on the results in the ring, that his second lease on a wrestling career took him smoothly to the top. But it wouldn't be accurate. As a strong babyface, even though he was just one of many in the promotion at the time, money and business were great. EMLL, known by the boys simply as the Impressa, ran more shows and drew more fans by far than any wrestling company in the world at the time. Love Machine was booked on as many 10 dates a week, frequently on weekends working a semifinal in one arena and driving two hours to another arena to work a main event on a show delayed until he and the other headliners doing double shots, even sometimes triple shots, would get there. Between his guarantee and per-match bonuses for working the extra shots, he frequently earned in excess of $3,500 a week. It would have been great, but nothing in his life was exactly how it seemed. Since there was no time to go home with that kind of a schedule, he flew his family down to Mexico to live at the hotel. They hated it. They wanted to go home, and eventually they did. But with no potential job prospects at home, and more work than he could handle, and the money flowing in Mexico, he had to stay and take quick trips home every few weeks. 
There were problems at times behind the scenes. One time in the office, Machine sucker punched Blue Panther, who he was feuding with in the ring as well, in the face. At times, the office was very worried about out-of-the-ring exploits and wild lifestyle, but bit its lip because Machine was very reliable when it came to business. He was one of the few foreigners who was adaptable to the style and was turning into a leading drawing card. It was the feud with Panther, the veteran heel with amazing popularity, that put Love Machine on the map as a genuine drawing card. They spent months building the feud before setting up a mask versus mask match at Arena Mexico. On April 3, 1992, before one of the largest crowds in the history of the 40-year-old building, Blue Panther defeated, Blue Mach- defeated Love Machine in a mask versus mask match. Approximately 18,000 fans sold out the 17,100 seat building, selling out well in advance. Another 8,000 fans were in the parking lot watching the match on big screen set up to avoid the expected overflow trying to overpower arena security and storm the doors to get in. While there had been bigger larger overflow crowds in the building itself it was and still is the largest crowd to ever watch a match taking place live in the building one month later conan the wrestler who made the contact that brought him to mexico and antonio pena the booker who gave him his chance left the impresa to form triple a with help of televisa panther soon followed leaving Machine without his leading rival. Behind the scenes, Machine and Pena negotiate a three-year contract for an estimated $3,500 per week. In 1994, it was renegotiated upward and extended for five more years at approximately $4,000 per week, making him one of the highest paid wrestlers in the country to join AAA. His entrance to the promotion was symbolic of his exactly two years to the day tenure with AAA. The main event on November 6, 1992 in Acapulco pitted Rey Mysterio Jr. against Tony Arce of the Destructors in a mask versus hair match with Rey Mysterio under a mask and Panther as the respective seconds. Panther freely interfered in the third fall until Mysterio finally hit the ring, took off his shoes, and removed his mask, revealing Love Machine, his former rival. Machine chased Panther to the dressing room, while Mysterio Jr. clamped the abdominal stretch on Ars for the third fall submission. By the end of the year, Barr was finally licensed to wrestle in his native Oregon and returned for a Christmas night tag team tournament where he, called American Love Machine, and Conan won the Pacific Northwest Tag Team titles at the sports arena. By this point, all the controversy from his past had died out, and there were no media outcries when he was licensed or when he came back as an international star, still as a babyface. The belts were taken to Mexico, where they became renamed the AAA World Tag Team titles. The famous Juan de la Barrera sellout run 13 sellouts in 15 weeks. Climax by Triple Mania followed, with Machine and Panther continuing to feud. The first major show after Triple Mania was July 18, 1993, in Tonalo, Jalisco, a suburb of Guadalajara, headlined by Machine's Hair versus Panther's Mask. It drew what was believed to have been the all-time record of 20,000 fans for the Guadalajara market. Panther began began the mask as a excuse me Panther began the match as a heel, although he always had his chair of support, machine as a face. Sometime in the third fall, that changed. One look, one cocky smirk, one or two lifting up his beaten opponent at the count of two. That's all it took. No outrageous interview, no bizarre angle. Maybe in one minute, 90 seconds at the most, 
and everyone in the building caught on, and not only did they react, they were infuriated. After six years of playing babyface, Love Machine had found his professional calling. While Machine lost that match via disqualification for using the dreaded Tombstone Pile Driver and had his head shaved while Panther went out on the stretcher, he had just found the key to real superstardom. One month later, Eddie Guerrero and El Hijo Dos Santo were partners in a trios match with Machine on the other team. Machine unmasked Santo, put the Santo mask on, and started beating up Guerrero. Guerrero then turned on the real Santo after Machine gave him his mask back. The next week, Guerrero formed a tag team with Machine, and the Gringo Locos were born. The Gringo Locos literally changed the style of Mexican wrestling. With Guerrero introducing more and more of the New Japan stiffer, offensive style and suplexes, and Machine introducing American style heel big bumps in the ring, Ric Flair style chops, and combining it with the Mexican high spot style, and an incredible array of facial expressions with the others younger wrestlers quickly emulating, they took Lucha Libre to the next level. The two almost immediately became the top tag team in Mexico. On August 27, 1993 in San Jose, California, when Machine and Guerrero teamed up for the first time in the United States, it was obvious they were one of the two best, if not the top tag team in his native country as well. At home in Oregon, he still had one last controversy up his sleeve. He was home on December 4, 1993, and showed up unadvertised, unannounced, and unlicensed, his previous license had expired and he hadn't had it renewed. At the Portland Sports Arena for perhaps the most bizarre match of his career against John Rambo. This show was sandwiched in between a Friday-Monday hearing with the commission regarding Sandy Barr's promotional license and things didn't look good. Supposedly earlier that night, a drunk former area wrestler showed up saying that he knew that Rambo was a stooge for Commissioner Anderson. At one point, Machine threw a forearm to the bridge of Rambo's nose on what appeared to have been a double cross on a spot that required extensive surgery and the doctor said was the worst broken nose he had ever seen in his life. Machine later said that the forearm was an accident and that Rambo had early in the match kicked him hard in the throat and Machine was in fact coughing up blood after the match. But the match at some point turned into a shoot with them not doing the planned finish. After it was over, Sandy Barr grabbed the house mic and said that he had learned earlier that night that Rambo was a stooge to the commission, took off his shirt, and told Rambo to get in the ring and take his whipping. Later that night backstage, Machine and Rambo got into it again and started fighting on the staircase before it was broken up. Anderson tried to get criminal charges of assault and battery pressed on behalf of Rambo against Machine, but the police decided not to prosecute because of the belief that no jury would believe anything that went on during a pro wrestling match to be real. In 1994, Machine, after turning heel on television about a week earlier for the first time in his home area, gained another round of local publicity and some national television and newspaper publicity in the United States. He was being managed by Tanya Harding in a match in Vancouver, Washington. It was a combined show with AAA promoted by his father in grand, spectacular fashion at a 12,000-seat outdoor stadium. The show, a major miscalculation since AAA had no television in the area, drew only a few hundred fans and turned out to be a major financial flop to the point it temporarily shut down his father's promotion. However, the scene of him throwing a cup of water in Conan's face aired on newscasts around the country and on shows like Entertainment Tonight. He and Guerrero captured the AAA World Tag Team Championship from Santo and Octagon on July 23rd in Chicago when the Gringo Locos paid off heel referee Tarantes in the ring, an angle which received much negative publicity in Mexican wrestling magazines for being just too silly. A few weeks later, 
Conan turned heel, and the threesome that looked to dominate AAA wrestling for years was on its way. A modern-day version of the original Freebirds, with every bit the charisma, and with Guerrero even more ringability. The whole scenario was planned out. Sometime, probably before Triple Mania 1996, Machine and Guerrero would finally turn on Conan, leading to a singles match. Conan and Machine had talked about building it to the point the match would be held at Azteca Stadium in Mexico City, which has a capacity of 130,000, and break the Hogan-Andre record. Whether that was a pipe dream or had a chance to be reality is something we'll never know. We'd have broken all existing house show records, said Conan. When, Mateen, when, when Machine turned heel, it was like the first time you saw a Sabu or a great Sasuke. He knew how to play to the television cameras better than anyone in our promotion. He knew how to play to the live crowd. I didn't know how to play to the cameras until I watched him. He'd look at the fans and blow cigarette smoke in their face when the cameras went on. He also debuted for New Japan Pro Wrestling over the summer under his original mask from Mexico as American Machine. He generally teamed with Guerrero's Black Tiger and Black Hat, who he had frequently teamed with earlier in the year in AAA, as a mid-card tag team to work with Jushin Liger and Shinjiro Otani and Two Cold Scorpio. The original plan was for Liger Machine to wrestle for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Belt in December, but Liger's broken ankle put that on hold. As it was, Machine was scheduled to return to Japan for the January 4, 1995 Tokyo Dome show. He had mixed feelings about Japan, however. After his recent divorce, he had been given custody of his son, to the point that he cut down his bookings in Mexico and came home more frequently. Although he, org he, although he recognized the three- and four-week tours as being positives for his career, he wasn't in the position of needing any outside work. He had talked to wrestling until he finished up his AAA contract in 1999, having his house paid off and coming off the road and talked to being a normal father. But with the exception of Shawn Michaels, there was no wrestler in the Western Hemisphere that was more of a certainty of being a major impact player for years to come, making the chances of him being able to walk away in five years exceedingly long. Outside the ring, the year wasn't a run of four-star matches every week. His marriage, which survived the pressure of the publicity from the rate charge, the job changes, the wrestling lifestyle, and the phone calls from a Mexico hotel rooms finally unraveled. Even though he wasn't home much and the negative publicity had disappeared after the column or two concerning the Rambo incident, the pressure of it never ended on him mentally. He talked before the summer of his impending 10-year high school reunion, wondering what all of his friends he'd grown up with would think of him after all they had read. He had a new fiancé who took care of Dexter often while he went to Mexico and who was expecting another child. On May 27th, Love Machine was in a mid-card trios match at Triple Mania 2C in Tijuana. The other principals in the match were largely forgettable, but his performance won't be by any of the 18,000 in the bull ring that night. From the moment he stuck his head through the curtain, he was 200% on. He had the knack that exceedingly few wrestlers do of making every single move, every single movement, every bump, somehow seem special and get a big reaction. Every bump was a little different, just a tad more spectacular than the norm. His energy level was higher. His style was more complete. His frog splash was unique from any other leap off the top rope. From the opening strand of Van Halen's jump as he came through the crowd, until the match and the post-match were over, he whipped the crowd into a frenzy. Even though the match was one fall, relatively short, and had a nondescript DQ finish, he had transferred his incredible energy to the crowd and left it buzzing. When the match ended, the crowd started doing a wave. A wave was all the rage a few years ago. From time to time, waves had been done at major U.S. shows, even more often in Japan, where people did them almost because of a big show the fans know at some point they were supposed to. 
almost like it's their duty. But this wasn't a wave because there were TV cameras there, or a wave to do a wave like at the WrestleMania Toronto, when fans did it while a match was actually going on, ignoring the match itself. This was a wave caused by one wrestler, who they all hated, but who gave them so much energy they couldn't sit still when it was over. Love Machine's last match took place on November 6 in Los Angeles and stole the show on the When Worlds Collide pay-per-view. While he was originally put on the card, the card was revamped and he was taken off. It took much lobbying from both himself and outside forces, along with agreeing to get his head shaved to get the planned Santo vs. Guerrero singles match excuse me, singles mask versus hair match, turn into the double mask versus double hair match on the pay-per-view. It turned out to be one of the best matches of the year in the United States. He wanted to wrestle on the show, badly enough to agree to lose his hair at something of a bargain basement price, 7500 plus bonuses based on gate and buy rate. Make no mistake about it, he was well aware of just how good he had become, and that few outside Mexico knew it, and that this was his chance to show it. He was also aware that no matter what he did in Mexico, what crowds he drew, or even in the United States for that matter, it wouldn't be accepted or respected within the provincial American wrestling hierarchy unless people saw it with their own two eyes. There was nobody more focused on leaving no stone unturned and having the best match of his life, and making sure that people understood that he was what he thought he was. A few days before the match, he was so excited he just couldn't wait. This was going to be the hardest show in the country to steal, but he and Guerrero were stealing it. He'd planned and plotted for weeks on how. A few weeks early in Japan, Chris Benoit and Shinjiro Otani screwed up a move they planned to debut as the finisher in the New Japan Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Tournament, where Guerrero was on Pegasus' shoulder and Otani was to come off the top rope with a Frankensteiner. Otani couldn't maneuver his weight correctly in midair, and the move didn't come off as planned. Machine and Guerrero decided they were going to debut the move on pay-per-view and get it right, which they did. Yet, when it was over, Machine was actually slightly disappointed. Maybe the letdown of when something you anticipate for so long actually takes place and is over leaves one with an empty feeling. Almost a perfectionist when it came to analyzing his own matches to begin with, he was almost never completely satisfied and always looking for ways to improve and experiment. He thought the first fall was too short and they rushed in, rushed in other spots due to pressure on cutting the match down in time. When people who have never seen you or haven't seen you in years and when they last did you were nothing but a prelim boy, read things like someone is the best heel in the world in most cases, the reaction is natural skepticism and ready to be disappointed. Nobody was. The scary part was, he had only been a heel for 15 months, and he was only going to get better. People could no longer dismiss him because he was only 5 foot 10 and 200 pounds, or because his fame was an American flag clad heel in Mexico, or because even in front of big crowds in the United States, it was only Mexicans that were watching, and that because of that, somehow, none of that counted. And finally, within his promotion, he had something in his present and no longer in his past that he would immediately be associated with. His reputation was made with an exclamation point. Even if he were to never work for an American promotion, within his profession, he'd be known as a superstar commodity. His future in wrestling finally was guaranteed. But as with the rest of his life, for the final time... Things weren't as they seemed. Art Barr's funeral was scheduled for November 30th at the Springfield Memorial Gardens and Funeral Home. His death may significantly impact the future course of both American and Mexi Mexican wrestling in ways few today actually understand and nobody will ever truly know. And even if that isn't the case, it leaves an emptiness, an emptiness in the entertainment week of the millions who didn't know him, and hated him with a passion every Saturday night and Sunday morning on television, and a much greater emptiness to the few who did and didn't. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to check out our website, www.rasselrama.com. That's R-A-S-S-L-E-R-A-M-A. -S 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 -E Shoot us an email with uh, maybe whose obituary you'd like to hear, what book you'd like to hear. Uh, you can 
email us at uh, rasselrama at gmail.com. And again, our website, www.rasselrama.com. And until next time, take care and see ya. Has all that is here to this great city of Baltimore. Ladies and gentlemen, from Baltimore, Maryland. If there's anybody that's a big star in Baltimore, it's you. In Baltimore, whether you like it or not, you better learn to listen because I'm the best to live. This is tonight, and Jackie Jeff Rustin returns to Baltimore at the Baltimore Civic Center tonight. And I have picked Baltimore out to be the place where this war is going to come to an end because they got a lot of nice, fine hospitals there. You know it. I know it. And Baltimore is... It's the night of champions in Baltimore, Maryland in the Civic Center.